All right, if you will, turn me to Romans chapter 10, Romans 10. In verse 17, we read, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So this afternoon, I want us to talk and continue our, our series on uh, these different biographies and how God has used these different men uh, throughout history, uh, both men and women, to advance his kingdom, to bring light into darkness. And this afternoon, I want us to consider uh, one of the reformers by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. Uh, his name may be familiar to many of you sitting here, but maybe you're not really familiar with his life and his contribution to the Reformation. Um, so, really, Zwingli is a fascinating man who God used to fan the flames of Reformation during his day. Uh, he's an interesting person in the fact that he was a huge contributor to the Reformation, but, you know, basically he remains unknown to, to many within the church. I mean, they, like I said, they may have heard his name. His name is kind of unique but they really haven't heard or, or thought much about him and how God used him. But he was one of the pioneering reformers. Uh, historically, uh, he is one of the three great reformers. Uh, he's up there with the ranks of Luther and Calvin. But he was part of the Swiss Reformation. And uh, one of the things he's noted for is he had a high view of the Scriptures. He is quoted as saying, Do not put yourself at odds with the Word of God, for truly it will persist as the rhyme follows its course. One can perhaps dam it up for a while, but it is impossible to stop it. And so he understood that all um, societies, if they were going to be uh, reformed, uh, it had to have the primacy and the centrality of the Word of God. And so he started a revolution in uh, religious thought in Switzerland that really paralleled the work of Luther in Germany. Um, it's interesting, though, uh, he was not really uh, influenced at first by Luther. Uh, this is what Zwingli wrote. Before anyone in the area had ever heard of Luther, I began to preach the gospel of Christ in 1515. Any of y'all remember when uh, Luther nailed the, the 95 pieces up on the, the door of Witten, Wittenberg? What year? 1517. So two years before that actually took place, uh, Zwingli uh, had started preaching the gospel. He says, I started preaching the gospel before I'd even heard Luther's name. Luther, whose name I did not know for at least another two years, has had definitely instructed me. I followed the scripture along. So he was born in 15, uh, 1484 in one of the cantons of Switzerland uh, on the eastern part of modern day Switzerland. To give you some perspective of where you are in history, when he was born in 1484, it would be just a few years later before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. In what year? 1492. Alright, so now you know the rhyme. So this would have been seven years um, uh, after, uh, or this would have been sometime after Luther. He was born, uh, when, when um, uh, Zwingli was born, he was born to a rather influential family. His father was wealthy enough that he's able to give him a first rate education. Uh, he quickly showed himself uh, to be a very bright student. Uh, at an early age, he excelled all the teachers in his community. And by the age of 14, he went to the University of Vienna. Uh, he earned a bachelor's in 1504 and a master's in 1506. Uh, after college, uh, he, he was ordained to the priesthood uh, in the Roman Catholic Church and served in the pastorate at uh, Glarus, which was his boyhood church. So let's think through some of his influences. During this time period, his professors were Renaissance-influenced and humanist. Uh, now, humanists back then during that area uh, just meant they had an interest in the classics. For example, architectures uh, would study out the architecture of the older societies such as Rome and Greek, the Romans and the Greeks. In other words, they wanted to know how they made those structures. And so there was an interest in the older literature. Um, you know, if there was an interest in the older literature, there, they would be interested in the ancient language such as Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So... Back then, to be a Renaissance person, being taught under this Renaissance influence meant that there's just a renewed interest in the old text and in the old way of, of looking at, at uh, history. So this is what Zing, Zwingli would have been exposed to. Now, why is this important? This is important in that uh, Zwingli excuse me, was a great linguist, and God would use this in the advancement of the Reformation. Um, Zwingli was influenced by a man... Uh, by the name of Thomas Wittenbach. Wittenbach was basically unknown except what Zwingli had to say about him. But Zwingli says he was the most learned and holy man he knew. He taught Zwingli that uh, the death of Christ was the sole price for the remission of sin and to not trust in the church, but faith is the key that unlocks the treasury for the remission of sins. This would have been revolutionary thinking back in his day. 
to, um, he, Wittenbach also taught him that the Lord's table was a memorial and not a sacrifice. So this man placed a gospel spark in the life of young Zwingli. And so that's a great testimony towards this man. And this needs to just be a reminder to all of us, right? Um, we need to let our life be a testimony of the holy person and, and one who promotes the true gospel. Um, whether someone remembers us in history uh, moving in the future is not what's important. What's important is whether our life is a testimony to the greatness of God and the promotion of his truth. And so, you know, we need to be thinking about this. We need to have men like this Wittenbach poured into our lives, right? Uh, they are few. They're rare. So it makes them precious. And there's different reasons for this. Uh, one of the main ones is the, you know, our ignorance of the word of God and the God we say we serve. So you can't pour into someone something you don't have. So as we look at the life of Zwingli and those influences that were, you know, those men that were influencing his life, uh, this needs to be a reminder to each of us that we have a responsibility to pour into others, right? So as um, as we are fed, we want to feed others. As God enlightens our minds, we want to see the minds of others enlightened as well. Well, after his graduation, he was ordained in 1506, and early on, uh, uh, he just really demonstrated a uh, pastor's heart. Blackburn writes in his biography, he says this, the young pastor applied himself with zeal to the duties of his large parish, visiting the cottages and the mountain slopes. And so it was said of him, he was free from all those scandals which disgraced the church of his day. And so he purposed within himself, this is what he said, I will be true and upright before God in every situation of life in which the hand of the Lord may place me. A friend of his said this, he became a priest and devoted himself to the search of divine truth with all of his heart, for he was well aware of how much he must know to whom the flock of Christ is entrusted. And so he had his work cut out for him, ministering within this area. Uh, Blackburn again writes, But he was, uh, he was pained to find such a contrast between the purity of the gospel and the corrupt lives of the people. Uh, the people in his day that he was ministering over were grossly licentious. And so the reason why was because of the corruption within the Catholic Church. Uh, the common phrase coined was, like people, like priests. In other words, the people were behaving and reflecting their priests. Now, during this time, he began to study Erasmus, uh, especially his Greek New Testament. And so, um, Erasmus is not known as one of the reformers. However, it is said Erasmus of Erasmus that he laid the egg that Luther hatched. And so, he set up this idea of going back to the original text of the scriptures. Erasmus put together a New Testament text during this time period, um, and it was used extensively by the reformers. And so as he got his hands on the um, Greek New Testament, uh, he began to memorize long passages of, of the New Testament in its original language. Now, Switzerland was not a country of vast natural resources. Uh, they didn't have great farmlands or mines, but what they did have was a lot of people. And so this means they didn't have much to export, so their primary means of export was through sending their men off as mercenaries. Uh, so during this time period, if you were going to go to war, you were going to hire some of these Swiss mercenaries. Uh, they were high in demand. So the French, the Spanish, and even the Pope, you know, they all contended with each other for these men's services. So this, as you can imagine, was appalling to Zwingli. Uh, he saw how this destroyed his congregation. So this is one of the first controversies he, he, he will enter into. And uh, you've got to put this into perspective. Uh, this was the driving force of the nation's economy. And to compound the problem, the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, endorsed this practice as well. So you have the culture, you have the Pope saying there's nothing wrong with these mercenaries, so what can Zwingli do? Well, he's forced to go to the scriptures. And so he starts to see that the Bible is the source of truth. And as a result of his preaching against this mercenary culture, as you can imagine, he becomes very unpopular. I mean, he's cutting into the profit margins, he's cutting into these people's livelihoods, and now he's going head to head with the Pope. All right. But God uses this controversy to bring in reformed thinking to Zwingli. And this starts to change his preaching style. Now, the predominant preaching style of their day was for uh, them to either take a text and read into it some obscure meaning. They were always looking for some kind of hidden meaning within the passage. Or they read into the text some fanciful myth or moral uh, of some type. Now, a lot of priests could not read the Bible, so, uh, you know, they had to read commentaries on the text. 
But Zwingli could read the Bible, and he started reading through and expounding the actual text of Scripture. So what's the big deal? I mean, that sounds kind of basic to what we do around here. But um, this was revolutionary in his day. And so he started this type of preaching before Luther and way before Calvin. But this style of preaching that he began to bring, this expository going through the books of the Bible systematically, this style of preaching um, was approved, improved upon by Calvin, certainly. Uh, it was later even you know, by the Puritan, William Perkins. And remember, Perkins really took this idea of taking a text to understand it, exegete it, and bring it, you know, the proper application to it. But Zwingli was the pioneer of this model of sermon preaching. Now, over time, his preaching style did take on popularity. And so as other men began to come to reform thinking, they began to look at his way of handling the text of Scripture and begin to apply that in their own churches. Uh, Zwingli encountered Tetzel of Switzerland. Remember, he was the salesman employed by the Pope to sell indulgences to raise money for St. Peter. Remember, uh, when Luther was confronted with all this, he posted his 95 Theses. But there's another man by the name of Bernard Sampson who was also selling indulgences in Zwingli's territory. Uh, he didn't write any theses. He simply preached them out of his territory. And, and so that's interesting how he just continued to preach the truth and preach the truth and preach these, these impostors out. Um, his preaching was so strong that Samson left town, but he starts to see problems within the church, and he starts preaching the word against the abuses of the church. And so around 1519, his popularity takes off, and he's asked to come to the church in Zurich. Now, this might sound like an opportunity, uh, but the leaders of the church told him that his job was to fill the coffers. That's what they wanted him to do. They wanted him to be a bill collector within the pulpit. He was going to be judged by how much money he could raise. Does that not sound familiar? Uh, but Zwingli had other ideas. His intention was to come in and preach the gospel. His plan was to start in Matthew and preach straight through the New Testament. And so before his death, he preached through every book of the New Testament except Revelation. But once again, I can't emphasize how radical this was. So he preaches for about a year, and the plague hits his town. Years earlier, the plague hit Europe where about one-third of the population was killed, and it was not uncommon when the plague hit a town that 50% of the population would be wiped out. So it was disastrous. And so the reason why this is important is because you start to see the real pastoral side that resides within Zwingli. Uh, when the plague broke out uh, in, Zwing, you know, um, in Zurich, Zwingli was, on, you know, was out uh, of town. He was not there. And when the news comes to him, he immediately returns. Now, once the plague came into the city, they would quarantine it and prevent people from going in. And against the advice of his friends, he returns. And in order, uh, I think, for us to understand this man and, and his actions and his responses, uh, you just really got to understand his pastor's heart. There was a genuine concern for his flock. Um, I mean, this is why he confronted the mercenary issue, for example. Remember, he was a patriot, and uh, he was very concerned about his country, but he also saw the destruction that this lifestyle brought to the families within the congregation, this destruction of sending their men out to go fight wars for other people. Um, so he, you know, we kind of see from you know, uh, studying this man out, he cared about his flock, and he would do the same thing when it came to indulgences. He saw that it was so destructive um, that he would go to the scriptures and wage war against it. So... The plague hits Zurich. He's out of town. He immediately comes back against all the advice of his friends. He goes back to Zurich to nurse the sick, bury the dead, and comfort the families. And in the process, he contracts the plague. Uh, he was on death's door, but he did eventually recover. And what's interesting is that uh, the biographers note a change in his preaching and writing at this point. Uh, there seemed to be more of a sense of urgency. And, uh, you know, death has a way of doing that to an individual, particularly a pastor. So getting close to death will make a man reevaluate his life. But, once again, his heart was always that of a pastor. And don't, don't ever lose sight of that. So I hope to encourage you as, you as we go through these different biographies, go back and read up on these men. And you're going to read a lot of neat things about Zwingli and his influence in uh, his day and era. But uh, don't allow the academics, don't allow all the, the writings and stuff that he did to ever overshadow his pastoral heart for his, his flock. All right, now in contrast you know, with someone like Luther, Luther was a monk, a scholar, and a professor who led a reformation but uh, when you read about him you never really get that great sense that he was a pastor at heart not to say that he was a bad man or anything like that but there's a difference between Luther and Zwingli uh, when you read through it also when you study about Calvin 
uh, if you, do you remember when we talked about him uh, before? Uh, he, he, you know, Pharaoh got him to stay there in Geneva. Uh, remember what he wanted to really do? He really just wanted to go set aside in his academics and write, you know, uh, write his books. Uh, but he's very reluctant. Uh, but he became a pastor. Uh, but still, Zwingli stands out as the pastor of pastors during this time period. Um, now. Let's talk about some of the events in his life. Um, are any of you familiar with the affair of the sausages? All right. In 1522, there's a printer in Zurich who was trying to complete a large print job. And so he's working his employees pretty hard. So what he does is he works, you know, all, all of his workers, he served them sausages. And the problem is that uh, this was during Lent, which caused quite a stir. Uh, and this actually, the fact that he served them sausages during Lent, uh, was brought before the government officials. So, what does this have to do with Zwingli? Well, he happened to be at the printer's house when this event took place. So, when this went before the government, Zwingli began to preach from the scriptures that Lent was not found in the scriptures. And his argument won the day, and this actually set a precedent. This led to a number of debates in other areas where people began to question the legitimacy of a lot of the church's practices which is always a good thing. We need to keep going back to the scriptures and asking ourselves, why do we do what we do? I mean, each and every one of us in here, we talk about Sunday morning. We ought to be able to explain to people when they come in here, why do we read the word of God? Why do we pray? Why do we sing? Why do we preach? And more importantly, why don't we do all these other things that we see in other churches going on? So the scriptures rule the day. All right, so he convinced the, the, the government of Zurich that reforms were needed. And uh, so Zurich becomes a Reformation city. And the Reformation becomes very organized where the church, the government, and the trade organizations come together to bring reforms within a city. All right. Um, you also see the mass is removed from the worship service in Zurich. You also see that uh, where, where these pastors were required to preach from the scriptures. And once again, this is a novel idea that I think needs to be resurrected today. We need to preach from the scriptures. Uh, this move, you know, actually allow the removal of um, unqualified preachers who cannot even read the scriptures. So it begins to weed out the unqualified pastors. Um, also, the wealth that had been extorted in the church where gold and silver accumulated was now melted down to distribute to help with the poor. So a lot of things were going on in Zurich during this time period. But in 1524, he marries Anna Reinhardt, and uh, this, you know, facilitated and encouraged other uh, clergymen to do likewise. So, in a very short period of time, he moved the church in a very disciplined way. And if you understand the period, then you know that Zwingli was pretty radical for his day. So, there were men who were disciples that wanted to take what Zwingli was doing and take that teaching further. And um, these disciples started pressing this idea, where in the New Testament do you see the church and state working together? Because what was going on during this particular time period is the, the thought that uh, you need the government to reinforce the edicts of the church. So there's this kind of hand-in-glove relationship between the church and the state. Now keep in mind you gain citizenry within European countries by being baptized into the church. All right, So this goes all the way back to Augustine. Now when the church disciplined, the government actually carried it out. And so the reformers actually handed off the licensing of marriages, for example, to the government. The church would perform the ceremony, but the government had the authority over the marriage. The government would t uh, make sure that there was no heresy within the church. So there's a very heavy-handed government way of dealing with things, and as you can imagine, a lot can go wrong when you have these people in these government uh, positions, particularly if they're not believers. Uh, they can use their authority in a perverted kind of way or in a harsh kind of way. Well, there were some disciples that began to challenge this proposition. And these men were referred to as Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists really describes a very diverse group of people. Uh, and, and they're kind of misnamed in my opinion because when we think of the Anabaptists, we tend to think of them as just rebaptizers. And that's certainly true. There's a wide group of people that were called Anabaptists. They did rebaptize themselves. But don't think of their position of baptism just fully describes them. What really united the Anabaptists was their view of authority. And these men began to challenge Zwingli. Zwingli was really struggling to answer their questions from the scriptures. So he does the worst thing possible. What he does is he goes all the way back to Constantine who institutionalized Christianity. And it was his view that monopolized, you know, uh, Constantine's view that monopolized uh, 
uh, the thought between the relationship of the church and t- state for about a thousand years. So Zwingli argued that this had been the tradition for a thousand years, and so it must be right. You might say a problem with this. He's been arguing against this. He's been arguing that the church, you know, that church tradition is not authoritative. As you can imagine, that didn't really sit well with these Anabaptists, and they continued to press him. Zwingli, who has this very close relationship with the government, um, I think he, he was probably a better politician than, than Luther, and you know, Luther was close to Frederick of Saxony, who protected him, and certainly Calvin worked closely with the government there in Geneva, but Zwingli put the government on these men as heretics. And uh, so now they're being brought up on trial. Zwingli is now testifying against them. And because of the accusation, these men are actually being executed. So their mode of execution was to be placed in a sack and thrown into the river. And, you know, unfortunately, that's one of the sad parts, sad history of the Reformation within Zurich. But many of the Anabaptists fled the area and moved to other places in Europe. So when you study this man out, this is going to be brought up. You just need to be aware of it. What about the Marburg Colloquy? Um, I want to talk about this. Where This is where Zwingli... And so whenever you study out uh, Zwingli, you're going to read about this one here, the Marburg, uh, Marburg Colloquy. Um, so it's M-A-R-B-U-R-G and then uh, C-O-L-L-O-Q-U-Y. All right, so this is where Zwingli and Luther come together to debate issues. Now keep in mind that Luther had support of the strong government officials in Germany. Um, Zwingli had the support of a small canton in, uh, inside of Switzerland. So Zwingli needed allies because you had nations like France and Italy who wanted to bring these reformed communities back to the Catholic Church through force. Now, just as a point of interest, Zwingli and Luther did not really have an impact on one another. It really wasn't until Luther debated Eck that uh, Zwingli had ever heard of Luther. In fact, Zwingli had been enacting reforms before Luther nailed the 95 Thesis. So there's an opportunity for these two alliances to get together. So they set up this Marburg uh, colony. And so there was 15 points of discussion that they had concerning doctrine. And there was a lot of agreement between these two men. Uh, Much agreement except on the final point which dealt with the Lord's Table. Specifically, they were arguing over the issue of the presence of Christ in the table. And uh, so this is no minor detail that they were arguing about. Luther was arguing the presence of Christ in the bread and wine because the scriptures say, this is my body. Therefore, Luther reasoned, it's his body. And this was his argument. Now, Zwingli tried to get Luther to see that, for example, when Christ says, I'm the vine, he's not saying I'm literally a vine. The reference to the vine was used as a picture, an aspect of Christ's work for us. He's not saying I'm a plant. I think we all get that. He's saying I'm not a vine, uh, or he's saying that I'm a vine and that I provide life and nourishment for those who are in need. And so Zwingli went through these types of arguments, but Luther would not respond. Uh, He just sat there writing, this is my body, over and over again. That's got to be annoying, right? Um, So they could never find agreement with with one another on this particular point. Now, there's two points I want to bring up about Zwingli here. First, he came to these meetings with a strong desire to have an alliance with the German reformers. Uh, From a political standpoint, from a church and pastoral standpoint, he wanted an alliance with Luther. And yet, as much as he wanted that alliance, he was unwilling to compromise on this issue. Now, I don't know that we can can necessarily say this about Luther. Uh, He did not trust the Swiss, and uh, he didn't quite know what to think about Zwingli. The other thing about Luther is that if you disagreed with him, you were his enemy. And even though uh, after this meeting, those who were friends with Zwingli, um, Luther even had a low regard for them. It wasn't enough that he didn't like Zwingli, but even if you liked Zwingli, he didn't like you either. All right. And so even after this meeting, uh, those who were friends with Zwingli, uh, Luther had a low regard for them. But um, even though there's a great advantage to, to Zwingli to compromise, the thing I want you to take away from this is that he would not. Luther's position was unbiblical, and Zwingli called him on it. So they couldn't come to any kind of agreement. Secondly, I want to point out the spirit in which they left the meeting. Luther wouldn't shake his hand. He accused Zwingli of being of another spirit. Luther even questioned Zwingli's salvation. Luther's point was that if this man does not believe in consubstantiation, he cannot be saved. Zwingli, on the other hand, left the meeting in tears. He had a great love for Luther and what God was doing through Luther in, in Germany. 
and that love was maintained throughout the remainder of his life. Uh, so Luther does not have this generous spirit. Zwingli, on the other hand, had a respect and appreciation for what the Germans were doing with respect to Reformation. Uh, Zwingli stood strong on his principles but maintained a generous spirit and a desire for ultimate unity. In other words, he just had a desire to see Christ magnified and exalted. And so some have criticized Zwingli for not making a clear and positive statement on the Lord's table. He just believed it was a spiritual representation. It pointed to a reality. Um, but that's kind of where he left it. All right. Now, the final thing I want to bring up about Zwingli is that there were some uh, southern cantons, um, and they were Catholic, who were threatening war against him. So Zwingli rounded up some men to march on these southern cantons, and along the, uh, the way, one of the cantons decided that they wanted to place an embargo on these southern cantons. Zwingli was against this because in, in an embargo, it's not the soldiers who were going to be hurt, but the women and children. They're, in other words, they're going to be starved out. And by starving women and children, this is going to provoke the men to fight harder, in his opinion. Uh, this would even provoke other nations to support uh, starving Catholics. So he lost the argument, and a year later, the southern cantons did rise up and march on the northern cantons. And the northern cantons went to war, uh, even though they were greatly outnumbered, and Zwingli went to war with them. And so if you ever uh, look up him on the internet and things like that, you're going to see statues of him as he's holding the Bible in, in one hand and the sword in the other. He was a patriot and a pastor. And so he went out with the troops against um, all the odds and against the advice of his friends, and uh, he did die uh, on the battlefield. Uh, he did appoint a successor, Heinrich Bullinger. You might be familiar with him, but um, anyway, Bullinger later on took it on, and, and then you start seeing his influence, and particularly uh, the influence of Zwingli through Bullinger leads you to the uh, Helvetic uh, Confessions. So, you know, we don't really, you know, you kind of think of Calvinism, Lutheranism. You don't really think of Zwinglianism. <laughs> but if you go and read the Helvetic Confessions, you'll get a real taste of what Zwingli uh, thought and taught. So let's talk a little bit about his, his theology in the remaining moments here. Um, his style, theology, of course, you know, as he began to read the scriptures, uh, it was based on an interpretation of the Bible. Um, he did take the scriptures as the inspired word of God. Uh, he had placed them above human sources such as, you know, um, ecumenical councils and the early church fathers. And, uh, you know, there are two truths that held up his worldview. Number one, the supremacy of the revelation of the Bible. And the second was the sovereignty of God. Uh, he did believe in predestination. He believed in the sovereign grace of God. In other words, he did believe that God will have compassion on whom he will have compassion and he will harden whom he hardens. Zwingli, unlike most in our country, had a high view of the organized church. Uh, he spent quite a bit of time developing the visible-invisible church distinction. I think it's important because there are a lot, uh, we were talking about this earlier at lunch, uh, there's just a lot of different groups that because of some doctrinal difference, they won't work with them. Even though they both believe in the same gospel, they have the both both have the same gospel foundation. They refuse to work. And so, you know, if you pay attention to, to our confession, our confession does talk about a universal church. And it doesn't say that only Reformed Baptists are in the universal church of God, the elect. All right. So um, keep that in mind. He had a high view of the church in that sense. So um, he spent a, quite a bit of time developing these themes of the visible and invisible church distinction. And I think this was a... Um, you know, required in order to respond to the Roman Catholic Church position, who, who teaches that they're the only church. The Roman Catholic Church thought that um, there's no salvation outside of Rome, so Zwingli had to develop a response. So the invisible church is comprised of all the elect chosen by God and saved by Christ. And the idea here is that those who are, in, are chosen in Christ, that number is only known to God. And so the invisible church always manifests itself visibly. Zwingli said it this way, the invisible church does always express itself in external organization. For the people of God belong to visible communities and consist of those who make an outward credible profession of faith. Now, he was quick to respond that not all who were in the visible church were elect, so he did understand that principle. He also taught how uh, you could recognize a true church. And he taught there were three marks that identified a true church. Number one, the faithful preaching of the Word of God. It had to be there. Number two, faithful administration of the sacraments. That had to be there. And then number three, a faithful administration of discipline. 
All right. Zwingli also followed the Reformation teaching of sola scriptura. Uh, Zwingli's contribution to the Reformation was, you know, just his revolutionary style of preaching through the Bible. So let me just kind of give you an overview of some things. 1519, he started preaching through the Gospel of Matthew. Then he continued to preach through Acts and Timothy and Galatians, First and Second Peter, Hebrews, John, and the other Pauline epistles. Before he went back to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, he started with the Psalms, and then he followed that with the Pentateuch, followed by the historical books. But that model that Zwingli created of this expository teaching and preaching through the books of the Bible is something that Calvin would take and develop further. Uh, that model was also used by the Puritans in the 17th century. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, back in the 1900s, picked this up, picked this style up, and brought a resurgence of expository preaching in the 50s and 60s. But it had gone away, and it disappeared for the most part. Zwingli also believed that faith comes by hearing the word of God. He believed that the scriptures should be applied to every area of life and that the gospel deals with more than just uh, you know, individual salvation. Uh, the gospel does deal with individual salvation, but he believed that it had an impact in every area of life. Uh, he believed that the influence of Christ and his word would and could transform culture. Ligon Duncan said this about Zwingli. Zwingli might be called by some a transformationalist, a, a, a Kyperian. Um, he believed in the rule of the God extending over all of life, not just over personal life, not just over church life, but over everything and was constantly personally involved in political, economic, and military alliances in order to gain advantage for the gospel. So he believed that salvation was by grace alone, by faith in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And um, his predestinary views of God's sovereign decree uh, would have been very similar to our positions as well. So when Zwingli talked about faith, um, he believed that true saving faith demands an active commitment to God and his word and his law once again, in every area of life. And that commitment to God is seen by submitting to his law. And God's law is found um, only within God's divine revelation, but nowhere else. So his impact is, uh, you know, once again, not all that obvious to many within the church today. As I said earlier, you, you've heard of Lutherans and Calvinists, but you don't really think about uh, Zwinglians. But uh, his influence is felt all throughout the church. I mean, we're benefiting. We're still standing on his shoulders today in a lot of ways. But Calvin was greatly impacted by this man, and uh, he did leave a legacy, uh, and he left us a model of always going back to the Word of God as the final authority. So let me just end with this thought for you. If we want to see true reformation, then we need to go back to the authority of the Lordship of Christ and the authority of his Word, because that's where all true reformation starts. And so if, if you're finding your own self cold, uh, distant, um, just you can tell something's just not right within my own walk, go ask yourself this area. Where is Christ not Lord of my life? You're going to find your problem. Where have I not gone to his authoritative word and brought my life under his revealed will? That's where you're going to start finding the, 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 the uh, root of some of your lifelessness within you know, the Christian walk. So... Hope you know I gave you this afternoon just enough, just a taste of Zwingli to want to go out and study him a little bit more. Uh, I think these these series are, are very important for us because um, a couple things in Psalm 145, God tells us to teach our children the great works of God, and I don't think it's just limited to biblical history. Uh, I think we have biblical history and see the great things that God does, and a lot of times if that's where we limit it and leave it, we kind of say, well, yeah, God worked back in the Old Testament, and, and yes, I'm in the, the first century. But does he still keep working? Yeah, these biographies tell us that, yes, God is still working. Uh, keep in mind, um, Zwingli didn't just wake up one day and say, well, I'll just try to see what happens if I start trying to reform a culture. No, he went to the Word of God. He proclaimed the truth of God's Word. He stayed consistent with it as much as he could. And you're going to see how God used that to bring about reformation within his own area. And then how he influenced even generations after him. Uh, I, think, I think you guys understand this, but let me just say it again. When you think about the first generation of Reformation, you think about guys like Luther and Zwingli. Calvin's that second generation. You know, Calvin stands on their shoulders, and Calvin takes that a little bit further. And then it's through Calvin that you begin to produce some of these other men as well. But keep this in mind. If we want to see true Reformation in our own life, we want to see Reformation here in our community, it has to come under these two ideas of coming under the Lordship of Christ and coming and submitting ourselves to the authority of his word.